Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Hall with the Western Historical Society. On August 16th, we ran a walking tour of the village of Graniteville. And I know some people weren't able to make the tour. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit the high spots in Graniteville that we talked about on that day. I'm standing at the Graniteville Methodist Church. Let me begin to say that Graniteville grew up around Sergeant's Mill and of course the quarries. In the mid 1800s, there was only about six families here. When the railroad came through, it offered an opportunity for industries in Forge Village, Graniteville and Abnasset grew up because of that railroad. Graniteville was known as Stone Quarry up until the late 1800s when C.G. Sargent, the developer of Sargent's Mill here in Graniteville that supplied much of the work for this area for years and years. C.G. Sargent also was the one that contributed to the Methodist Church. His family put up some $10,000 in the 1870s to build the Graniteville Methodist Church. The Sargent's lived on the other side of the Mill Pond. And the Mill Pond was created by the Sargent's in order to run the mill that was the heart of Graniteville. And they built that mill in 1859. There are three houses on the other side of the mill pond across from the church. The first one belonged to C.G. Sargent, the second belonged to Alan Sargent, and the third belonged to Fred Sargent. Alan and Fred were sons of C.G. Sargent's. As I said before, Sargent started on the other side of the mill pond. They moved originally to the corner, which is now known as today as 12 North Main Street. But in 1877, they built this building. And this was in existence until 1960. Sargent's itself closed in 1990. Behind me is the Broadway Apartments. These apartments were originally built for the workers who worked at C.G. Sargent's in the 1800s. And of course, you know, when Sargent's closed, it had several owners and still houses apartments today. This fire station behind me was built in 1948. It's a residence today, but it housed the fire department from 1948 until 2003. And in 2003, the Rogers station at the corner of Town Farm Road was built. Prior to this, the house on Cross Street was the one that was used as the fire station. And prior to that, it was over by Johnny Haley's or Haley's Oil Company. It's the Arthur Schott Hose Company, number two. Okay, we're on Cross Street, and um, believe it or not, this house you see here is the site of the Albert R. Choate Hose Fire Company. I said 1908, but it was actually 1914 when this was used. And it was used up until 1948 when the Brick Firehouse was built. Albert Archo Firehouse, Company 2. This is the um, post-159 Legion Hall. And this was probably the center of Granable, you know. It originally was Haley's Hall and then became Abbott Hall and then became the American Legion. Um, all kinds of things were held here. Um, you know, they had dances and penny sales, and this was actually the first place I ever voted was right here. And um, believe it or not, they, uh, they had al elementary school classes in here because the kids from NAB would come down before the new NAB school was built, and uh, there was an overflow in Sargent, so the kids would actually go to school here, believe it or not. Um, but after World War II, um, it was named after Frederick S. Haley. Fred Haley was um, a 1916 graduate of Western Academy who served in World War I. And after World War I, he came back to town. He was the son of J.A. Haley. Came back to town and worked for his father. And actually was a captain of the Schott Firehouse. When World War II broke out in 1940, 41, although Freddie was in his 40s and too old for the draft, he somehow got back in and was sent to back to Europe with the Allies. Um, Freddie was killed uh, in Normandy in September of 1944, uh, three months after the Normandy invasion. Um, he was the oldest 
W.A. Garage to serve World War II. This is uh, Frank Furbish's old homestead. Frank uh, was born in Freeman, Maine in 1861, and he moved to Granville in 1880. A few years later, he started working for C.G. Sargent Company, which he worked for 57 years, and he rose to position of a consulting engineer. But that's only part of Frank's story. Um, the service to, to town is remarkable. I'm just going to give you a few of the things he served on. He was a selectman for 12 years, board of health for eight years, school board for 12 years, police, actually was a police chief for a year, fire department and finance committee. Um, and also he had a business, which we'll talk about when we come down Broadway later on. But this is Frank Burbage's health. When Frank died in 1940, the sergeant's company let all the workers out, gave them a half day off so they could attend Frank's funeral. So that was the big deal. This is Frank Burbage. We're now on 4th Street in Graniteville, and I wanted to point to the house behind me, number 4, 4th Street. This was originally the Blodgett store that had been moved from across the mill pond, the site of where the original Sargent's and Calvert was built. It was originally the Wright and Bemis store. But when that building burnt in 1929, Mr. Blodgett moved it over here. And then he sold the business to a Mr. Green. Green owned the store, and um, it remained a store until probably the late 40s or early 50s. We're still on 4th Street here, and behind me is the home of uh, Jack Doucette. Those folks who have made some affiliation with the Blanchett School, Jack was a longtime principal there. And sadly, Jack left as much too soon a few years ago. But this is his home as where he grew up. His mother was also a teacher at the Western Academy, and his sister also taught in town, too. 11th 4th Street, 1930, Lowell Blanchett and his son Roy were living here. Lowell, born in Maine in 1953, died in Westford in 1936. In 1940, Roy, now married to Mildred Stevens and daughter Meredith were living here. Roy's occupation for the 1940 census was listed as the ice business. Roy was the guy who delivered your ice to the ice boxes before the coming of the refrigerators we know today. One of the most prominent buildings here on 4th Street is this condo building. Um, and the interesting part of this building is that this building was moved here in p parts from Fort Devens during the 1920s. And I guess after the war to end all wars uh, was completed, they figured there was no use for it. So uh, it was bought up, brought down here, and made into apartment buildings, and they're now condominiums. This is an interesting home at 11 and 13 Third Street, kind of sits back. But this was a barn at one time. If you look at number 13, where that young lady is standing on the porch, she'll tell you there's a hayloft on that side. And on this side was part of the barn. It was moved from River Street probably, ooh, 100, maybe 150 years ago to this location. Hi, I'm at the corner of Broadway and First Street, and behind me is a sign dedicated to William R. Gower. Uh, William was commonly known as Roger Gower. He lived down here in Broadway next to the Legion Hall. Roger was an outstanding soccer and baseball player. And he actually, when the town had a team go to the national tournament in Kansas, Roger was one of the players. Um, he, during World War II, he served in the Army Air Corps and over year, in Europe and flew over 19 missions for shot, being shot down and killed in January 1944. He, Roger and his crew received an accommodation from Winston Churchill and General George, George Marshall. This is the sign here. I'm at the corner of First Street and Broadway. This, what you see behind me, are homes that were built uh, after Parents Market was uh, put out, went out of business and was torn down. But this site housed Parents Market, which was really one of the uh, <laughs> landmarks of Graniteville for, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, well into the 90s for about 50 years. Roger Parent and then his sons ran the store. Um, prior to that, it was a first national store run by John Tandis, um, and that was, goes back to the 30s and 40s. 
these houses behind me is uh, on First Street is where the Idlehour Country Club was located. It actually was built in 1915 by the Richards family as a bowling alley and developed by the Melanson family. And during the 40s, the 50s, and into the 60s, uh, it was one of the key night spots. Uh, many wedding receptions were held there, uh, Christmas parties and um, New Year's parties as well. It was the place to be. Ultimately, um, those of us who lived in the area remember the 1980s when it became a Hells Angels bar, actually, uh, and kind of was taken over by bikers. Um, by the late 1990s, Frankie Melanson, Louis' son, decided he had uh, had enough of the business and sold the land, and these three houses were built. This is the house of um, Bobby Wall. Um, Bobby Wall was really the founder of the Westford Little League. When they found that it was called the Westford Small Fry League, because the reason they did they called it Small Fry League was the town really didn't have the funds to join the national organization, so they called it Small Fry League. I'm going to read an excerpt from the Lowell Sun from 1953, September. Uh, Robert Wall, organizer and coach of the Westford Small Fry League, was presented a substantial purse of money at the recent playoffs, an outing held at the, for the teams at the Abbott Park Rainbow. The presentation was made by Edwin Evans in behalf of the parents of the young boys in appreciation of Mr. Wall's work and devotion to their summer. Um, if, when the Little League first started, a small fry league, when you picked up your uniform in the spring, you came here. When you dropped off your uniform after the season, you came here. The, 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 the phone number for the Western um, Small Fry League was Bobby Wall's house. And, um, you know, he was really the guy that got it going. He later became a priest, Bobby did. And uh, when we go up the ball field, we have a little plaque up there for him assigned uh, de in dedication to Bobby Wall. So this is his house. We're on First Street still. Behind me is a home, was a home of Mr. and Mrs. John Cannell. Um, the Canals became a very prominent uh, family in town. They had five sons. One son, Joe Canal, became police chief. Uh, one of the other sons, Jack Canal, became town council. Another uh, son, Danny, became a prominent attorney in town. And another son, Bill Canal, had a business up on Route 40 next to Mario's Diner, a uh, uh, filling station. But they were very prominent. Uh, if you go up the center in Cornell Drive, that's where that name comes from. But this is their home. This is where they grew up, right here standing by number 20, First Street, and this is the home of Amy Jarvis, and I mentioned Amy. Amy was a barber uh, who actually was in Forge Village. I think there was five or six barbers here in Graniteville. But Amy gave a tour to Marilyn Day um, through Graniteville, which we're kind of using as the tour guide today. Uh, and. Um, some of the things you're not going to see, if we missed, I would suggest you pick up this book because it gives a detailed history of some of the homes here in Graniteville. We're on River Street now. Behind me is this home here was actually a clubhouse behind the baseball field. Um, what, would, what they used it for was visiting teams would come in and play ball. And the visiting teams would actually stay here. And it was, you know, served as restrooms and showers and such. But they moved it down here in the 1920s and became a house. And this is on River Street. I run River Street still. And behind me is a home, or was the home of Noelle LaDuke. Many folks may have seen the movie League of Their Own. Uh, Noelle actually played in that league for four years. She grew up here in River Street and she started playing baseball at the age of five, behind, right behind here. And this is where she was discovered by Rita Briggs, who was playing for that league, the All-American Girls Baseball League. Newell played four, league, four years in that league, and uh, in 1988, the uh, Hall of Fame in Cooperstown had a women's exhibit, women in baseball exhibit, and Noella's name is on that exhibit. But she grew up right here and uh, played baseball behind us. This barn you see at 8 River Street belonged to Lester Reeves. He had a stable there and raised horses at one time, probably gave horseback rides. Uh, Lester's probably better known for the garage he had uh, in the center of Forge Village, um, next to what's now uh, the pizza place. A little uh, Then he built a second garage uh, with his now phase two auto body. Uh, 
his son John did not want to take over the business, so they they ended up selling it. But Lester had a little thing here for horses. I'm at the corner of Broadway and River Street. Behind me, you see the uh, the railroad bridge, which is known as the Counter Bridge, some hundred years ago. Uh, I'm standing in front of the property here, belongs to Keith McLaughlin today. Uh, but this was the site of the Carpentier blacksmith shop, which became also the Carpentier repair shop, uh, automobile repair shop in the 1920s and the 1930s. We're at the entrance to American League's baseball field. Behind me is a sign which dedicated to Father Bobby Wall, who was really the founder of the um, Western Little League. He really was. And to my left is uh, my house, and there's a garage there, which really was the center of the Little League in the early, early days. The teams would keep their equipment in there, and they'd just come and go as they pleased. And uh, my house served as like a all-purpose house. If like, somebody needed a bathroom or a telephone or somebody would ride didn't show up, they'd be watching in the house watching the Red Sox, my parents. Um, and sometimes I need an empire, they'd get my father out of supper. But... Uh, that was in the early, early days of the league and uh, when it was just getting off. The field, G1, the one that bears my name, incidentally, uh, the Jeffrey Hall field, was actually the original field that was here and the only field that was here. And this goes back to the early part of the 1900s. And um, if you check Bob Oliphant's things uh, that you regularly see, with the Westford Wardsman, he talks about uh, any number of teams coming in here and playing on a regular basis. Soccer games were played here. It was owned by the Abbott Wisted Company, and they turned it over to the town in 1957 after they had left. But we had some semi-pro teams that came here. Uh, one named Dixie Walker, um, who played for the St. Louis Cardinals, I believe. And the Dodgers uh, actually played here at one time. It was advertised. So um, it wasn't just little leaguers here. Uh, some, some pretty prominent ball players played here as well. Behind, we're on Broadway here. Behind me is the, uh, this was the site of Frank Furbish's Chevy dealership. We talked about Frank earlier in the tour, and this was his business. Um, after Frank sold the business, Norman Nesmus owned it, and he had a filling a service station. And then later on, um, Bob Herman, who some of you may know, had this station as well. So this is the history of the, we used to call it the Broadway Garage. So it has quite a history here in town. And uh, just a side note, the, sh uh, the sh new cars would come in on the railroad tracks were crossing the funeral home, and then they were trucked over to here, the Frank's Garage, when they had the Chevy dealership. Mm -hmm. I'm in front of 10 and 12 Broadway Street. Number 10 is where your fire chief, Joe Todd, grew up. His family bought this place in 1919, the Wilkes family. But it's probably most famous for the basement of number 12. In the basement of number 12, there is an oven that they used to baking bread and other goods that were sold to the people in the area, Wilkes Bakery. At the corner of Broadway and 2nd Street, uh, this is the Holmes, Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S. You can see this little area that juts out that was one time was a little candy store, but it was also a barber shop at one time. Arthur, uh, Arthur Holmes owned it. Uh, right now, it would be Arthur's grandson, Mike Dutton, who lives here. His mother was Janet Dutton, who was the postmaster in town um, several years back. Uh, but it's a historic house, as I said. There were many little stores in and along Greenville 50 or 60 years ago, and this was one of them. The quarries, Abbott, Sargent's, all were major parts of the industry here in Graniteville. But the one that has sustained itself from, I guess, the 1860s up until today is J.A. Healy's and Son Heating Oils. They didn't all start out as heating oils. I'm here with John Healy and Bell Healy, actually. Yes. John, give us a little background on it. Well, the company started in uh, Founded by my great-grandfather in 1879. He had migrated from Canada in the 1850s, settled here in Graniteville, and the company was established in 1879. The building was constructed in 1883 that houses us today, and it's been five generations of us, uh, family, and on so, and 
to the present day. So it started out as um, wood, coal, building products, wagons, teams of uh, for hire to haul stuff around Granifal and parts, parts maybe into Lowell as well. But uh, so anyway, it's been a, a long run over 140 years so far. And with, as far as I can, I'm concerned, we'll keep going as long as we can. <laughs> Geez, I hope so. Yeah, I need yeah. the heating oil, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is an interesting part of Granitzel history, this little area behind us, John. Absolutely, I'll get away from the door. Um, this, for, uh, by the group, John and I, and Jimmy Van Beaver, and our group, this is where we hung out. It's the basement of Haley's office, and it was called The Hole. And we were here for several years. Several years. Until we got out of here, and Johnny's father had just about enough of us and told us we could leave. <laughs> But uh, you could do any night of the week or on the weekends, uh, particularly in the winter time. Yeah. yeah, it was a nice warm place um, um, to come and sit and uh, and just kind of relax and kick back. So the whole. Well, that kind of concludes the tour. We're back here at the uh, Grandful Methodist Church. Um, behind me is the Mill Pond. Um, I want to give a plug to a community group down here called Graniteful Pride. Uh, Johnny Healy's wife, Diane, was one of the driving forces behind beginning Graniteful Pride, getting the work done to um, dress up the pond. Uh, this Bond with the Pond was an initiative of the Westfield Academy service team in May of 1998, and they combined with uh, the Mill Pond Restoration Committee and a lot of members of Graniteful Pride. Um, two, uh, maintain and and keep uh, pride within this village. Uh, I want to also mention that there is much more to Granitesville's history, uh, starting at the town farm and going all the way up North Street uh, to the Gould Picking Farm. And uh, we didn't get a chance to walk that, but I would suggest if you have any any questions on that or interested any further, stop up the museum. Linda Green has all of that information. We'll sit down with you. Uh, there are plenty of books on Graniteville's history, as there are in the other villages, and there are also videotapes. So, looking forward to seeing you at the museum. Open 9 to 1, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and reopening from 2 to 4 on Sundays.